Hi, my name is Connie McLanus and you're watching the video Thyroid Eye Disease Introduction. In this video, I will provide you with a brief overview of some epidemiological factors as related to thyroid eye disease. And also, um, we'll discuss some of the key components of the pathophysiology of this disease. Before we move on, however, to discussing thyroid eye disease, we first need to come to appreciate that there are a lot of terms that are utilized to mean thyroid eye disease. And here is a list of synonyms, Graves orbitopathy or Graves ophthalmopathy or ophthalmic Graves disease or dysthyroid eye disease. All of these refer to thyroid eye disease. This does make it difficult in terms of when you're looking at the literature, uh, you will come across different textbooks, different papers discussing thyroid eye disease utilizing different terms. And the reading that you have will also vary in terms of what term it utilizes to be discussing thyroid eye disease. So just be aware that these terms are used interchangeably. So by now you would have seen the video on the thyroid and on thyroid dysfunction. Thyroid eye disease is a manifestation of a dysfunctioning thyroid. And almost all patients, 90% of your patients who have thyroid eye disease will be hyperthyroid or will have hyperthyroidism. As such, the majority of your patients have Graves' disease. So Graves' orbitopathy is part of an autoimmune disease which is composed of three things. Hyperthyroidism, orbitopathy and pretibial myxedema and acropachial finger clubbing. Now over here to the right we have uh, myxedema shown just there um, on the left leg. Uh, this is a, a relatively mild form. And then below here we can see the finger clubbing and the inflammation at the um, tips of the fingers there. Now with these particular signs, the myxedema and the acropachy, not all patients will exhibit these signs. It's usually only uh, a few up to about 5% of patients will have this in addition to the hypothyroidism and the orbitopathy. So whilst Graves orbitopathy is characterised by those three or you could consider them four uh, clinical signs, often uh, you may not see those last ones. It's usually the first two, hypothyroidism and orbitopathy. Now the complication begins here. Graves orbitopathy is often used as a general term to refer to thyroid eye disease. However, Thyroid eye disease can occur in a patient who doesn't have hyperthyroidism. In a small portion of patients, they will be hypothyroid or euthyroid. The euthyroid patient is the patient who has a normally functioning thyroid gland, and the hypothyroid, as you've already seen in your previous um, videos, is uh, a patient who has an underactive um, thyroid gland. So you have 10% of patients who technically uh, do, don't have Graves' disease as the term intends to be used. So for this video series, to avoid confusion, I will use the term thyroid eye disease and it um, will mean any of these patients, whether hyperthyroid, euthyroid or hypothyroid. However, bearing in mind that 90% of what we're talking about is patients with Graves' orbitopathy um, and uh, hyperthyroid patients. Now looking at the epidemiology of the condition, not all patients who have hypothyroidism or Graves' disease develop or go on to develop thyroid eye disease. Only 30 to 40% develop thyroid eye disease. It's also worth noting that thyroid eye disease can occur at any point in time during the stages of um, the thyroid dysfunction. So it can occur um, either before thyroid dysfunction is detected or afterwards, or it can occur concurrently. Sometimes it can occur years later and when the patient has become euthyroid as well. Statistically, about 20% of patients are diagnosed with thyroid eye disease concurrently at the time that they're receiving the diagnosis of the thyroid dysfunction. Another 20% is diagnosed before um, the diagnosis of thyroid dysfunction. And so the first thing in these particular patients is the eye symptoms. And then later, within six months, the patient is being diagnosed with also the thyroid dysfunction. But at the time of diagnosis, there aren't the clinical signs there 
to point to the fact that the patient has hypothyroidism, for example. The other 20% will be diagnosed with thyroid dysfunction but will have no orbitopathy or no signs or ocular signs. And within six months, will actually develop the thyroid eye disease. And finally, 40% of patients won't display any signs of um, thyroid dysfunction until over six months or after six months post um, the diagnosis of the thyroid dysfunction. And for some patients, yes, it can be a long time after, like a year or two. Okay, women are more affected than men, both in terms of having hypothyroidism and for the thyroid eye disease. Women are five times more likely than men to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism, and women are two times more likely to be diagnosed with thyroid eye disease than men. The mean age of someone being diagnosed with thyroid eye disease is about 45. And finally, you need to be aware that smoking is a risk factor for developing thyroid eye disease. It's been found that thyroid eye disease is four times more likely to occur in patients who are smokers or former smokers than in non-smokers. Now, the mechanism for this is not fully understood, but it is very well known that um, if a patient continues to smoke and um, they have thyroid eye disease, it can negatively influence the outcome of any therapy that's given, and it can actually um, exacerbate the symptoms for the patient. So you really need to ask your patients whether they're smokers, and if they are, you need to direct them to stop smoking uh, in order for treatment to be successful and to avoid um, the exacerbation of the condition. So in relation to thyroid eye disease, what is the pathophysiology? Well, we know that thyroid eye disease is an autoimmune disease, and we know that the autoimmune reaction uh, that occurs is specifically occurring within the orbit. There are several other factors that also support that this is an autoimmune disease. One, thyroid antibodies um, can be found in patients who only have thyroid eye disease and have no thyroid dysfunction at that time. Also, uh, thyroid eye disease is associated with other autoimmune diseases such as myasthenia or diabetes, meaning that you can have a patient that has both myasthenia gravis and thyroid eye disease. It's not that common. It's something like 5% of the population of individuals with thyroid eye disease also have myasthenia gravis. But the fact that conditions um, that both are related to a dysfunction of the immune system supports that we're looking at a process within the eye that's occurring that also is autoimmune related. Now, much of what we see in relation to thyroid eye disease relates back to an inflammatory process and its consequences. And two of the main things that happen, which I'll talk more about in a moment, is that we see enlargements of the extraocular muscles and an increase in orbital volume or orbital fat. And we can just see here in the image here, this is the medial rectus. Here we have the eye and the optic nerve, and uh, these blue circles indicate orbital fat. And with thyroid eye disease, what happens is we get um, an infiltration or an increase in orbital volume with more orbital fat, and we also have an enlargement of extraocular muscles. In this instance, um, the medial rectus being depicted. And so much of the signs and symptoms we see of patients uh, which we'll talk about in the next video, also come back to that inflammatory process. Now, the pathophysiology process specifically is quite complex, but as I just mentioned, it is an inflammatory process. And what we have is connective tissue inflammation and the activation of extraocular muscle fibroblasts. Now, it's this stimulation of the fibroblasts that actually leads to uh, the orbital spaces becoming crowded in, in thyroid eye disease. And what we see is that um, the activation of fibroblasts increases orbital volume uh, because there's a differentiation that occurs from fibroblasts into orbital fat. And also what we're having is the fibroblasts are producing mucopolysaccharides. So this process where we have lymphocytosis and mucopolysaccharide infiltration leads to these enlarged extraocular muscles and orbital spaces that become quite crowded. 
Now, with the orbital spaces becoming crowded, as we see here, and the extraocular muscles are quite enlarged, and um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a subsequent video, but with this, we start to threaten the uh, optic nerve, and here is the optic nerve. But you can imagine that if this extraocular muscle becomes much larger and starts to compress on the compress on the optic nerve, then we're likely to have issues with um, with vision. Okay, this uh, essentially happens in the early stages or in the wet phase, where we have a lot of um, uh, inflammation and uh, fibroblasts are being stimulated. At the end of this, as we enter into the dry phase, this is where we start to get fibrosis of the um, extraocular muscles. And so we're looking now at the more mechanical issues that are produced from the end stage of thyroid eye disease. Thyroid eye disease has two phases, the wet phase and the dry phase. The wet phase is that inflammatory stage, which is the active part of the disease. In relation to the extraocular muscles, this is where we have a myogenic disorder. So we have enlarged extraocular muscles, we've got mucopolysaccharide infiltration, etc., which is leading to a myogenic um, disorder of the extraocular muscles. In the dry phase, we actually enter into the inactive phase or the cicatricial phase. And at this point, what will happen is that uh, scar tissue and fibrosis will develop. So fibrosis of the extraocular muscles occurs here, such that uh, what we will now see is mechanical restrictions of the eye movements because of um, the dry phase or where we see uh, the fibrosis of the extraocular muscles. It's worth noting that some patients appear not to go through the active phase and that these patients present to your clinic at the end point um, where it appears they're in the dry phase and they present with uh, restrictive myopathy or restricted eye movements and so a mechanical uh, disorder. In the next video, we'll talk more about the signs that we see during the wet phase versus those in the dry phase and it'll become clearer uh, when you see patients if they're in an active um, or if they're in the active phase of the disorder or um, at the end uh, towards the dry phase. So what are the take-home messages regarding thyroid eye disease? It's an autoimmune disease. And yes, whilst the pathophysiological process is quite complex, the key thing to note here is that it's the orbital fibroblasts that appear to be pivotal to the pathologic process. It's the activation and the stimulation of these fibroblasts that appear to lead to, or lead to, I should say, to the increase in the size of the extraocular muscles and the increase uh, in the orbital volume, which then leads us to the issues we see down the track in relation to the threat of the optic nerve and also uh, mechanical restrictions of the eye or eye movements. The other thing to note is that Thyroid eye disease consists of those two phases, the wet phase, which is an active phase, and it's the inflammatory phase. And we'll see in a moment in the next video that in the wet phase, we see specific types of ocular signs um, due to the fact that we're in the active phase of the disease. And then we have the dry phase, which is the inactive component of the disease and where we actually see fibrosis and scar tissue, and in particular, uh, we're concerned about the fibrosis of the extraocular muscles and what that means for ocular movements. A couple of other things to remember. Sometimes patients will present with uh, no signs that they've gone through a wet phase and present immediately as though they've come to the fibrotic end of the process. The other is that patients generally will have hypothyroidism. 90% of your patients will be hypothyroid, not hypo or euthyroid. And remember that thyroid eye disease can occur at any stage. It could be that the thyroid eye disease is the very first um, sign that a patient may at some point down the track develop thyroid dysfunction.
And in relation to epidemiology, two of the key factors are that women are more likely affected by both hypothyroidism and uh, thyroid disease, and that smoking is an issue for patients with thyroid disease. And it does exacerbate the disease. It does um, interfere with treatment. So it's important that that is part of the management plan uh, in terms of asking the patient to, to stop smoking. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.